Good day and welcome to the Understanding and Addressing Executive Functioning in TANF Participant Webinar. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Mr. James Butler. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone, or welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar. As mentioned, Understanding and Addressing Executive Functioning in TANF Participants. Um, we have a pre-packed agenda for you today, so thanks for joining us. Um, what we'd like to do is first start with some introductions, and um, then we'll do an under, Jesse will talk about um, understanding executive functioning, and then we'll also go into um, how you can consider and address executive functioning skills during an assessment. Um, and later on during the webinar, we'll have sort of a panel discussion um, about these particular topics, um, ending with some Q&A. have a group of excellent panelists before you today. Uh, we have uh, Jessica Kendall from ICF International, uh, Dorothy Hall, who serves as one of the state program managers um, at the Utah Family Employment Programs and the Utah Dep Department of Workforce Services, Joe Raymond, who serves as the Director of Social Policy and Human Services at ICF, uh, Jesse Hancock, who is one of the Case Management Program Supervisors, um, in Boulder County, Colorado works. Melanie Dalmada Remedios, who is the Regional Workforce Coordinator um, in Washington State. And last but not least, Kristen Joyce, who serves as a researcher for Mathematica. I will turn it over to Jessica Kendall, who will talk about the understanding of, of executive functioning. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, James. Again, this is Jessica Kendall, and I'm with ICF. Dorothy and I are going to be spending the next few minutes sort of sharing a baseline of information about what executive functioning is and how we build those skills so that we can have a, a fruitful conversation about resources and strategies that you all can use in your work with CANA for, or in other human service program. My background on this topic um, and my passion about it, to be frank, has been one that I've carried throughout my professional career. At ICF, I work on a range of projects that touch TANF, justice, workforce, and anti-trafficking systems. But before I came to ICF, I, I was a practicing attorney and actually represented children who had experienced abuse or neglect and were in the court system. And so in that function, nowhere did it become more important to understand how we build executive skills than in my representation of my clients so that I could effectively support them in understanding their rights and responsibilities. And so when we think about what executive functioning is, we want to sort of get a baseline from you guys first about sort of what your understanding is of this topic. And so we want to do a quick poll question as we get started. How familiar are you with this concept of executive skills? Is it something you're really familiar with, moderately familiar with, somewhat, slightly, or is this an entirely new topic to you? Give folks a few seconds to respond. And I see some folks are using the chat box as well. Thank you. So it looks like we have a good number of folks, about 28%, who for whom this is a new topic, which is great. Um, and we, but we've got a real range here. So we've got some folks that are expert in it, as well as those are, are, are different varying degrees of familiarity. So hopefully this conversation today will sort of match all of your interests and needs. And we really encourage you throughout to use the chat box to share any questions or thoughts that you have along the way. And we'll try to address those at the end. Thank you. Let me close that poll. So 
first and foremost, what are we talking about here? Executive function is really a set of mental skills and mental processes that enable us to sort of maneuver through our day-to-day -day existence, whether that's at school or at home or at work. It's that thing that we, it's those skills that we have that help us plan our day, to be organized, to initiate a task, and then to finish it, to shift our attention back and forth as needed. No one probably anticipated that many of us would be working from home as long as we have, and some of us have children, maybe outside the door as we speak. I know I'm one of those. Um, and so there's this constant shifting of attention, right? Executive skills also include our capacity to regulate our emotions and our actions. So not only is it that ability to sort of plan and think ahead and do, but to regulate our capacity to do them to begin with. They call them skills, though, for a reason. And it's because we aren't born with these capacities. We build them over time. If you were to look at a side view of your brain, at the bottom, you'd see sort of that primitive brain, that, that part of our brain that runs our fight and flight response. And in the middle, you see your limbic system. That's sort of the seat of your emotional self. And at the top, you see the prefrontal cortex. And it's in that top part where these executive skills are built. And they build over time. In early childhood, a foundation of those skills are created. But it's really through adolescence, your transition to adulthood and into adulthood, that they're built. It's the part of the brain that takes the longest to develop and, in fact, carries through into our mid-20s. And if I were going back to the slide before, as you can see, if you think about yourself and that suite of skills from being planful to organizing to initiating tasks to your working memory or short-term memory, you might realize, well, you all have these skills at some level, but it's variable, right? I can speak for myself when I say, if I were to say what my superpower was, it would probably be to be very organized. However, my working memory isn't so good. If you and I were to meet at a party or a restaurant or wherever and you said your name, there's a decent chance I will not remember it right after you said it because my working memory isn't as great. Well, so how do I... How do I cope? Well, I like to write things down. I write notes to myself in real time to help remember things. I share that for, for two reasons. The first is I hope that one of the things you guys take away from this session today is the fact that, again, these are not traits. These are skills that we can all build. And in fact, we all do in different ways, whether that's to build upon a skill that might be running at a deficit for ourselves, or building a coping strategy or a workaround for a skill that you know, we might be challenged by. I'm going to turn it over to Dorothy to share a little bit more about what executive functioning is and why it's important. Dorothy? Thanks, Jesse. <clears throat> so why is executive functioning important? Um, well, when we're able to tap into our strengths of our executive functioning, it allows us to act rationally, or with reason, if you will. We're able to plan, problem solve, and prioritize. Basically handle all the things that are coming at us throughout the day. Likewise, the potential for reacting from an emotional basis is greatly reduced. When we utilize our executive functioning skills, we're able to complete our everyday tasks and to resolve the obstacles that come at us throughout the day. We are basically much more effective. Um, we're not so scattered, we're not operating from that more basic level of our brain where we're, where we're in the flight, fight, or freeze response. In order for our executive functioning skills to be powerful for, for us, you heard Jesse say our superpower, power, right? In order for them to be powerful for, powerful for us, we need to be able to be in a place where we can draw upon them. When we are under a significant amount of stress, I mean, can you say COVID-19, right? Um, we find ourselves unable to depend upon these executive functioning skills as well as we were able to do prior to the onset of that stressful event. As a result, 
we become more impulsive or our responses during the stre these stressful e uh, events become somewhat unpredictable. Next slide, please. This is the window of tolerance. Um, this was uh, defined by Dr. Siegel and created by uh, Dr. Uh, Dezelik. This is a helpful tool to help us put our own level of functioning into perspective for ourselves, as well as to recognize where our customers or clients are as well. Here's how it works. In order for us to have positive interactions for other, with other people, or to be able to effectively utilize our exec, executive functioning skills, we need to be in that center part, that yellow bubble, which is called the comfort zone. This is where we are calm, cool, and collected. This is where we can, we can tackle everything that's coming at us. Um, this is where we're able to tap into our executive functioning skills to the best of our ability. There are ways that we can remain in our executive in our uh, comfort zone. It's the orange bubble on the right. Um, the ways that we can do this are to practice mindfulness, to increase our own self-awareness, to use breathing technique, techniques, or to focus on use, use of positive statements for ourselves, positive self-talk. Um, on the other side is the green section. These are the ways that we get out of our comfort zone. So we get out of our comfort zone by, by being triggered by something. Usually it's a comment or behavior or tone of voice that someone else is, used, someone else is using, or perhaps it's, it's another person being perceived by us as a threat. The green bubble provides you a little bit more information about that. There are basically two responses. Um, that occur when we're out of our comfort zone. These are automatic responses, and they are, as Jesse described, at the lower part of our brain, our more base, basic, uh, basic response. These are, um, these are automatic responses, and they are primarily a result of increased hormone, uh, primarily um, cortisol. We can become hyperaroused, which is the pink bubble at the top. This is the fight or flight response. We know what happens when something when, we're, when, when a threat occurs, we either go into this fight or flight response or we go to a freeze response. This is when we're ready to fight or we become more angry or we become more defensive. This is the put up, put up your dukes part. Or we become hypo-aroused, which is the blue area. This is the freeze response. This is where people check out. This is when someone is standing across from you and it looks as though they're peering through you. They're not hearing what you're saying. And in fact, they don't have the capacity in this moment to be able to process what you're saying. So the more we can stay within, our, uh, within the center or our comfort zone of the window of tolerance, the more we are able to handle what we are presented with. When we're outside of our window of tolerance, we really need to tap out. I like to call it tap out. Someone else needs to try to work with this customer or client or our peer. We can't do it. We're not in a, a state of mind where we can um, where we can address that issue. When our customers or clients are out of their window of tolerance, they're not in a place to engage. We need to find ways to bring them back, uh, change the environment, um, have them sit down for a minute, have them step outside for a minute, offer them a drink of water, or give them a break, take a break. Next slide, please. Okay, Jesse and I are going to cover this, uh, this slide. I'm going to do the left and she'll do the right. So what helps us build or um, use our executive functioning skills? So the first thing we can do is um, kind of do an inventory to understand what our strengths are as far as our executive fun functioning skills and where our deficits are, where we have some challenges. We do an inventory to see where we can reduce some stressors for ourselves or for our customers or clients. You know, ask yourself, do we really need to finish this assessment today? Is there something that we can put on their plate next time? Um, we need to build upon strengths. So find out what we excel in or what our customers are good at, and then use them to our advantage. Um, if it's planning and prioritizing, how, have them plan and prioritize their schedule or what they're going to do for the week. One of the key components is celebrating successes, even the little ones, right? Praise goes a long way, but the one key factor about praise is it has to be genuine. So words go a long way as long as you're coming from our heart. You know, we don't want to have a, a root response, a rote response that we have for people. We really want to be genuine and connect it to that success. 
And then we want to use, um, so we need to use our executive function skills to model or teach our peers or our customers and clients and to pro provide them with tools uh, to practice and build upon these skills. Because all of those skills that they find challenging, they have the ability to increase as in adulthood. Jesse? Thank you, Dorothy. And another skill that I suspect many of you may use or at least be familiar with when helping to build or support executive skills is motivational interviewing, which is pretty common practice amongst many different human service arenas. And it is essentially using open-ended questions, active listening skills, and really emphasizes the importance of building trust in collaboration as you are gathering information from a customer. What does that, how does that relate to executive skills? Well, as Dorothy was saying when she had the window of tolerance slide up, it's through this type and style of conversation and approach and interviewing that you can create safe spaces and trust and rapport with an individual so that they can be in that calm state, that state where they can draw upon their executive skills um, and their rational thought processes to more effectively engage in conversation and planning and identifying their own goals and interests. I'm going to now turn things over to Joe Raymond to talk a little bit about executive function within the construct of assessment. Joe? Thanks, Jesse and Dorothy. I uh, appreciate that excellent overview. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with everyone this afternoon. Um, I think I'm going to start by saying this is such an important topic. I spent many years as a local county director of social services that go back in the 80s even, and I wish this kind of knowledge about brain science had been available as we tried to figure out how to approach people. Next slide, please. Um, I think we're going to start with another polling question before I get into my remarks. And that question, as you can see, is what are the biggest challenges your organization faces in assessing your client's executive functioning skills? We've already got some answers coming. And perhaps not unsurprisingly, it's inadequate staff training um, uh, and, and even time allotted. Uh, and I think rapport and trust actually relate to training. Um, so I appreciate that. This makes a lot of sense to me. And for at least for me, this topic of executive function is just a fundamental part of even customer service training because this relationship, of course, with clients starts from the moment a person calls us or they walk in the door to speak to a receptionist. Thank you. Enzo? So real quickly, um, you can see the objectives I'm going to try to reach today. I um, want to talk about how assessment uh, can highlight potential gaps in executive functioning skills. Talk about Aura, the online work readiness assessment tool as a specific example of assessment and, and its importance. I uh, want to touch on the strategies we can use with counter participants. Uh, Jesse and Dorothy began to talk about this a little bit so we can understand their circumstances and gather information uh, through an assessment, and then critically, how these assessments can be used uh, to, to highlight what services that are needed and refer folks to uh, services, not just uh, actually to refer services to people in the right order, too, which I think is critically important. Next slide, please. Excuse me. So, um, assessments. Uh, I'm not sure in, in my experience, we, I believe uh, assessments that are comprehensive and, and well-grounded in research are fairly new in the field, um, especially around executive function. But as mentioned, uh, executive function, of course, are the mental skills that folks have as they go through their daily lives and allow them to make decisions uh, that are actually even in their best interest. And obviously, perhaps it's important for us to understand executive function because these are the things that get in the way uh, of uh, appropriate decision-making 
uh, for our own interest. <clears throat> and as I think about all the experiences that I was in and watched our caseworkers go through, um, it was it's pretty clear to me in retrospect who wh which caseworkers really be, had an intuitive feel for this, and which caseworkers under did not understand the impact of toxic stress, the impact of poverty. We know now poverty is an actual health issue that affects us in many ways. And I also personally think uh, I did have a chance to do some focus groups in the state last year, talk to 250 caseworkers, and it was pretty obvious which caseworkers had been trained in executive functioning and which caseworkers had not. And my opinion, at least, is that those without the training, and from my experience, the workers, we tend to label people uh, um, in certain ways. And I, and I think this lack of understanding influences our perception of not only uh, um, clients and their approach to their own lives, we label them as lazy and other things, but it certainly gets in the way of the provision of services. So I think this business of understanding executive function is absolutely the, the first thing we need to, to, to do in our relationship with the client. Assessments are very useful because they actually can reveal trauma. And it is trauma that, that, that causes the lack of executive function. And trauma, as Jesse said, is a, is a learned skill. It can happen in childhood in a variety of ways. A variety of situations can cause trauma. But it also strikes me that if we can see trauma in adults. We can see trauma from military members who have experienced things overseas and aren't able to think as clearly as we'd like. And, and so this is really, really a critical tool across the board in Canada and other programs as we begin to build the relationship with our, our clients and customers to help them figure out the best ways to impact their own life long term. Next slide, please. So, and, and this is just a quick slide that clearly says, if, if we don't truly understand what folks are dealing with, the odds of us being able to connect them to services that leads to real improvement and real uh, sustainable economic ability are just not high. And while work and rapid attachment to work is important, as someone who has been part of putting many, many ten, uh, tens of thousands, well, thousands of people to work in my career, many of them were frankly not ready for work and they failed in work situations because we did not do as good a job as we might have to understand what they needed first in order to truly connect a sustainable employment situation. Um, I think that's a critical piece of learning, and it has to start with a comprehensive assessment. Next slide, please. So Aura is a, a very um, important example, which is still out there for use across this country, and I'm sure we can figure, if you're interested, we can talk to you offline about how to access it. This was developed by the federal government, the Office of Family Assistance. It's the online work readiness assessment tool. Uh, it was actually initiated and tested in Maryland and tested across the country in a variety of settings, tribal, urban, rural, et cetera. And it is a, a comprehensive, it's not just a tool. In my opinion, it's a practice model that is based on motivational interviewing, the building of rapport. It contains a series of questions that are comprehensive in nature, and they cover all of uh, the, the variety of categories that impact uh, any of our lives in terms of transportation, uh, health, uh, domestic issues, income, education, etc. And it allow the tool, the application of the tool through motiv motivational interviewing, importantly identifies strengths as well as challenges. And so starting from a strength-based approach, um, it, it provides a, a much stronger way to build rapport with the customer, rapport with the client, and begins to really help this person identify where they want to go with their lives. But it's a database kind of an approach um, that, the, that a caseworker can use, uh, and um, it, it, it is actually uh, quite an important tool. Within, within this entire process, uh, the tool provides an assessment. It auto-generates uh, a self-sufficiency or economic mobility plan, and it contains a host of labor and market information that are both useful for the caseworker and for the customer, and, uh, and it also is able to provide uh, real-time data reports that you can use to understand 
the strengths and challenges of your customers in any geographic area or statewide um, and, and can be used to frankly plan for services and identify gaps. Um, it can stand alone within an agency, but it can also connect to eligibility systems so that you don't have to do uh, dual uh, entry, especially for demographic information. And then I think most importantly, it allows caseworkers to establish concrete action steps in partnership with the client and referrals to, to activities and supportive services, again, in the right order. And I think that so this is a, we could spend the entire time talking about or I'm guessing many of you are familiar with it, but um, it is, is a perfect example of an assessment tool. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about strategies. And we're, we've been talking a lot about already about motivational interviews. Um, it's perhaps obvious to say this, but you cannot overemphasize the importance of rapport and trust with the client. Um, without that, it's an, ex it's an exercise that I don't think leads us to many places. Um, the, the ability to actually listen and listen authentically, whether in an in-person interview or even now in this environment to do it virtually, is absolutely critical. Um, if a client is not, does not believe you're in their corner and the exercise of eligibility and work participation becomes a, almost a dry checkbox kind of an event, the odds of them believing you're in their corner just aren't high. I'm sure many of you already know this. While, you, while this process is taking place, the caseworker should obviously uh, pay attention to the verbal and the nonverbal cues and be really sure the customer is comfortable. Um, patience is required. People tell their stories in a variety of ways and in a variety, with a variety of honesty because they're just very unsure themselves about what the trust really is in an agency. Sometimes our experiences and our processes are not as warm as they ought to be, to be honest. And in any kind of interview, in an aura particularly, the training around it is to make sure the assessments are conversational. In other words, if all the interviewer does is go through a list of questions, one through 30, and it's just rapid fire questioning, you're not likely to get a, a, the kind of deep answers you need to understand what's happening with the client. So if a client comes in and says, and you ask, um, how did you get to work today? I mean, to the office today, do you have any problems? They start talking about their car. You can quickly go in, in, in or to the transportation section, and you actually are trained to make it a conversational piece where you can skip around so it's not, a, it's not an actual you know, do it step by step. And that is part of the strategy, the motivational hearing part, to make sure the, per, the client is engaged with you and they know that you're actually there to help them uh, and not just conduct an, an eligibility exercise. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so obviously some criteria for success include that you're not rushing to complete the questionnaire. questionnaire if uh, you, you find that uh, the, the process is being broken up by attention or other things, if I have the kids with them, it's perfectly okay to, um, to interrupt the process. I know one state that actually starts the process um, in the office, and they actually still conduct home visits in TANF, which I think is quite remarkable, and they're able to finish uh, their questions and their interviews in the environment that the person lives in, which gives them a whole different understanding of the person. Um, the customer obviously has to be engaged in the process, trust and rapport, key to success. And, and the answers are critical, but at the end of the day, it's also the trust and rapport that are the real keys because you're, these folks are going to continue to be reliant on with you in a partnership way to help them figure out how to move their lives forward. Perhaps this last bullet to me is the most, most important um, for a variety of reasons. In my career, we made folks sign plans. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, these plans, frankly, were the agency's plan and not the not uh, not the customer's plan. And unless, like in any of, for any of us, unless the plan is indeed the plan that the customer wants, the customer wants to make decisions about what they do first and why. Then again, we're trying to make people do things that they may not be ready for, and the odds of success in that context again are not high. So to reflect on that. Next slide, please. 
Positive regard is a critical concept, and this starts back as a basis of motivational interviewing. Uh, I'm sure everyone got into the helping profession in order to help people. Uh, but to do that, you have to uh, believe in your heart and authentically understand in the dignity and the worth of, of all individuals, regardless of how they present to you. Dorothy and Jesse talked about folks coming in perhaps angry, uh, upset. That is a routine occurrence in a local department of social service. But, you, but there's many reasons for that, largely driven by their experiences, their trauma, their toxic stress. And we as a helper have to understand that. The right of self-determination is a core principle. It ought to, it ought, in our policies and our approaches ought to reflect the fact that they have the right to self-determine their future. And of course, the famous uh, psychiatrist Carl Rogers talked about basic acceptance and support of the person, regardless of what the person says or does. It does not mean you have to like what they say or do, and you don't allow yourself to be mistreated, but you still support and accept that person because that's just where they are that day. It is the foundational element of the customer relationship, and it's essential to build rapport and trust, which are, again, the linchpin for progress. And hopefully all of these are part of your customer service training package along with TANF. Next slide, please. So motivational interviewing or folks who use motivation, who are the motivational interviewers, uh, are applying techniques uh, that are clearly helper techniques techniques, and, and it's part of the change process, which is what you're helping this person go through. Acceptance and empathy through honest, reflective listening are critical skill, <clears throat> skills in interviewing. It is perfectly okay to real, reveal discrepancies between a client's goal or values and their current behavior, but it's done <clears throat> in context of the acceptance and the empathy. It is not a threatening revelation. It is a, if anything, it's a journey of exploration and, and, and learning. You want to avoid argument and confrontation, and you adjust any customer resistance, which would be a normal part of any process. And of course, supporting self-efficacy and optimism and constantly being in their corner as available as best you can are, are critical pieces as well. Next slide, please. So. Assessments can <coughs> excuse me, highlight the need, services, and referrals. Understanding the, uh, the uh, impact of toxic stress on executive brain functioning and decision making is critical. Uh, identifying and building on strengths is, is actually uh, probably one of the most important. Every person has strengths, and, and an appropriate assessment identifies the strengths as well as the challenges. And in general, my guess is a lot of the conversations we have with clients and customers in local department settings have to do with their challenges. And so uh, more than ever, it's important to, to, to point out strengths, uh, job histories, interests, family relationships, things that matter to them. Uh, the customer's priorities have to be uh, what you're really trying to focus on, uh, uh, and, and critically, what we've also learned now about creating uh, small goals to, that lead to big goals. This is how you build success. This is how you begin to gain trust. And of course, goals have to be realistic, measurable, and time-based. Um, recognizing and building on success is critical. I know one state is focused, many of their clients do not have, even have driver's licenses. So before they even start talking to them about long-term employment plans, they literally have a checklist of the small things they can help a person do before they move into the bigger things. And that, they report, at least to me, that that's allowed them to build the kind of rapport and trust that are necessary. Next slide, please. So, all of that, I hope, wraps up into a, 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 I know we're going to have a big conversation now about this, about how motivational interviews and assessments can be an indispensable part of your approach to customers. We have one more polling question to do before we start, start the panel discussion. To what extent have you incorporated assessing and addressing executive functioning skills into your program? I'm very curious about this question.
So most of you, almost 70% uh, are interested in doing more, so which so a small percentage in general have uh, are still uh, are, have done it to some extent. So I think that means this topic is really important. And the good news is more is being learned every day about these topics, and there are uh, a growing array of resources that allow uh, will allow you to move down this road should you so choose. Uh, thank you very much, Jesse. I'm turning this over to you. Thank you, Joe. Again, this is Jessica Kendall. Uh, as Joe had suggested, for much of the remainder of our time together today, we're going to be doing a panel discussion on this topic with um, our experts who are listed here on this slide. Again, we have Jesse Hancock with uh, Boulder County Colorado Works, Melanie D'Amato Remedios from Washington State Department of Social and Health Services, Dorothy Hall, from Utah's Department of Workforce Services, and Kristen Joyce from Mathematica. I wanted to start it off, actually, Kristen, with you as our sort of resident researcher amongst the, the group and ask you this. From your research, what have you learned about strategies that human service programs can use to help participants build these executive skills we've been talking about? Sure. Um, thanks so much, Jesse. So at Mathematica for um, the last several years, we've been studying coaching um, as a strategy that human services programs can use um, for building these, these types of skills. And so for, um, for our work, we define um, employment coaching as a coach working um, with a participant to set um, personalized goals that are meaningful to them. And then the coach is supporting and motivating and providing feedback as the participant pursues those goals. And like Joe was talking about, a real hallmark of coaching is, um, is building that trusting relationship and really working collaboratively um, with the participant. Um, and we also think it's helpful to think about coaching in contrast to traditional case management. Um, so in traditional case management, um, the goals are often set by the case manager. So in TANF, a participant might come in and um, be told, you know, you need to get a job and, and work 30 hours a week to maintain your benefits. And then the case manager, you know, is directing the client to take certain actions, um, like needing to apply for, say, 10 jobs in the month. And then the case manager's job is to monitor compliance with that, so, you know, collecting job search logs. Um, in contrast, again, coaching is really directed by, um, by the participant, and um, the client is setting their own goals that are meaningful. So, for example, um, a person might come in and say, you know, I'm really interested in working in a nursing home. I love working with the elderly. Um, and then the coach is helping the client decide what action steps they need to take um, to reach that goal. So together they might determine, you know, the participant needs a CNA um, and the, the participant will think about how they can um, take steps to get that certification, like, you know, looking for available training programs in the community. And again, the coach is supporting, motivating, encouraging the client um, as they're reaching that goal. And they might provide resources to help the participant. So if they um, you know, need to get a CNA, um, trying to help them find resources to pay for that. And I've done some field research, um, been able to talk to some coaches and participants um, to hear about their perspective of coaching. Um, and one coach I spoke to who was formerly a case manager, you know, she thought that coaching is much more client specific than traditional case management. And she said, you know, instead of directing the relationship, she's actually, she says, rolling with what the client wants. Um, and she felt like rolling with what the client wants uh, felt better to her um, than traditional case management. And a client I spoke with also, um, you know, felt like this coaching um, process felt better to her as well. She had, um, you know, been in TANF previously and felt like she was often, you know, pushed along through programs that she's participated in. But within coaching, you know, she felt like a human and um, felt like she had opinions and that those opinions were valued. Um, so it was, you know, a powerful experience for her. Um, so I want to talk about how coaching is related to building um, and strengthening self-regulation and executive functioning skills. 
So coaching actually incorporates um, executive functioning through teaching and practicing goal setting. Um, so we need executive functioning skills to, um, to set goals, set intentional actions. And so practicing and learning that process of goal setting is hypothesized to then strengthen um, executive functioning skills. And some coaching programs we've been studying, you know, more explicitly incorporate um, executive functioning skills. So again, like we've been talking about, some programs assess participants' executive functioning and, you know, teach them about the skills and their um, strengths and challenges. Um, and then um, some programs actually train their coaches of how to help participants address some of their self-regulation challenges. So a participant I talked to, you know, told her coach that, you know, she sometimes blows up um, and gets agitated at work, and her coach was teaching her breathing techniques and um, taught her, you know, you can walk away in situations and you don't always um, have to uh, react in the moment. Um, and the participant shared, you know, that was really helpful for her, and she's actually been able to, you know, implement that in her daily life um, outside of her um, coaching conversations. And again, that, that close professional relationship that a coach is building is very important. Um, you know, establishing trust and honoring a participant's autonomy can help improve their motivation, their emotion regulation, and stress management. Um, so that is definitely an important part. And coaches can also help um, increase participants' motivation through praise, like we were talking about. Um, and some programs provide incentives as well, um, and that can help. Uh, participants, you know, persist in their in their goal pursuit, um, and can also motivate them when they um, might face some of those self regulation challenges. So to help them, you know, keep moving forward. Thank you, Kristen. Can you then share sort of what participant focused outcomes you'd expect to change through some of these strategies? Sure. Yeah. So. Um, so we've hypothesized that, again, providing that coach is going to help um, strengthen self-regulation skills, and we're actually, you know, hypothesizing that that in turn will improve employment outcomes. So there's research that's shown that um, self-regulation skills are linked to employment outcomes. Um, so having, you know, strong emotion skills have been shown to improve, like, job attendance, um, job search outcomes. Um, and surveys uh, and interviews with employers have shown that they highly value soft skills, um, and soft skills falls under that self-regulation and executive functioning umbrella. So we are um, so testing this out with the evaluation employment coaching for TANF and related populations. Um, it's a, um, a study sponsored by the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. And so we're, um, we're testing the hypothesis with an experimental study of four different coaching programs around the country. Um, two of them are actually with TANF participants, so we're testing um, coaching as an alternative to case management in Jefferson County, Colorado, um, and in another program in Iowa. And so um, through the evaluation, we're testing out whether um, coaching can um, improve employment and earnings, um, reduction in public assistance receipt, um, improvements in personal well-being. And then again, we're um, specifically looking to see whether coaching um, strengthens self-regulation skills and then um, participants' ability to, to goal set, as we've been talking about. And so just so folks know if you're interested in some of those outcomes that so are just midstream on our evaluation, um, but we will have initial results um, the fall of next year, and um, our final results will be in fall 2022. And this fall we'll have some implementation um, findings reports. You can you know, learn more about these programs if you're interested. Um, and they've also included some, um, some products from our work so far, and the, um, you can get those in the downloadable files section. Um, so we have a brief about coaching, highlighting some of the things I've talked about today, um, and some snapshots if you're interested in the specific programs. Um, and then we also have some, um, some resources about measuring self-regulation, if that's interested, interesting to folks. And um, if you'd like to keep in touch, we have a list there, too. Um, you can email coaching at mathematica-mpr.com, and um, we'll be sure to get in touch with you uh, to share some more resources going forward. Thank you, Kristen. And I saw one of the questions, actually, in the chat box that came through a bit ago was, from an individual asking whether or not the resources that are shared today are things that they can share um, you know, with their larger team? And, and the answer is yes. So you'll see, as Kristen noted, the downloadable files section where there are several um, pieces of literature and practice materials that you can use 
as well as today's uh, slide deck. Thank you. We're going to switch gears. Um, I'm going to invite Dorothy and Melanie and Jesse to, to chime in here. And wanted to hear from each of you a little bit about both why and how you've incorporated executive skills training and skill building into your programs that you work on. Dorothy, would you start us off? Of course. <clears throat> Thanks, Jesse. So um, probably, I, I don't know if I should say a few years ago or several years ago. It's been probably about six years. We've been working on moving from a um, individual focus to a family focus and um, addressing the need to reduce intergenerational wealth or dependency. And so um, we started out with um, training our staff on motivational interviewing and an, a coaching model. Um, and, and then we discovered that executive functioning training would be important as we talked about how trauma impacts our customers. And so um, that's the why to it. How we did it was through training, of course, and through uh, incorporating um, the expectation of using motivational interviewing, addressing, um, or, or basically becoming more trauma aware, as well as the use of executive functioning skills um, in our quality assessment tool that is part of our performance evaluation. Thank you. Melanie. Also to you, why and how have you incorporated executive skills training into your program? Thank you. We took this approach to support our TANF customers with a strength-based, trauma-informed focus that improves both the customer and staff experience. And we've had success with customers and staff who felt this approach was refreshing, supportive, and much more individualized. So in Washington, we've blended in training topics and tools that encourage understanding and support for executive functioning skills, but not necessarily calling it executive functioning skills training for either customers or staff. For example, our eight-question customer self-assessment, otherwise known as the personal roadmap, allows customers the opportunity to anchor to what they value, select topics that they want to focus on, and then identify what they want to work on right now to get closer to their goals. And the voluntary self-assessment is written at a 5.6 grade reading level, and we translated it into 18 languages to increase access to the tool for our TANF and Workforce customers. And it supports that trauma-informed approach by offering multiple options in a way that's transparent. It also shows what our program can offer families and creates a space for hope. And it's been a way for customers to pause for a moment to refocus it frames our TANF program in a positive way and supports the task of planning ahead and allows our staff the opportunity to set them up for success to meet their goals. And it's also a way for people, our customers, to connect the dots from their strengths and values to what they want for their family, to identify what's standing in the way of their goals and how they want to take the first steps forward. So we know we heard a little bit earlier in the presentation that executive functioning challenges can be different for each individual. And we created a tool that could be tailored to meet the unique needs of each family. Some people may struggle to see the big picture while in crisis. For others, it may be making decisions or second-guessing decisions based on past experiences. And some folks may find it difficult to plan tasks or just not know how or where to start. And this is a chance to pilot and expand a new approach that supports trauma-informed practices, builds executive functioning skills, and increases pathways to resilience opportunities. Thank you. And finally, Jesse. Uh, yeah, so as, as we've learned, skills are built, um, and they're built in all of us. Um, in Boulder County, we really see training um, and investing in our coach, uh, our coaches as a priority. Um, and within that training, um, really helping folks basically as staff understand what they, um, as a practitioner, a coach, support specialist, uh, interchangeable terms in which people are using, um, is what they're bringing to the table, um, understanding how their values and actions and beliefs impact the work that they're doing, 
Um, so, you know, what, what values or beliefs am I actually putting on my participant? Um, it is really important for somebody to be able to step back as they're um, understanding just their own executive functioning skills. Um, and as uh, Jessica, you had mentioned earlier, it's variable. So we're, there's, you know, as a coach or a support specialist, we're not coming to the table as experts. We're also learning too. Um, and um, then being able to reflect and show that um, and work as we work with our participants. Um, and how we've done it is through a coordinated case management um, kind of philosophy that encompasses a lot of the different trainings that Melanie and Dorothy have spoken um, to as far as trauma-informed care, motivational interviewing. Um, and this coordinated case management is an umbrella that goes um, across all of the um, TANF coaches that we have in Boulder County, as well as all of the other support specialists within housing and um, our housing programs and the community organizations that we're working with. Um, the training is two, day, two full days, and it's all of the support specialists kind of learning and training together. Um, and then also really uh, holding up and um, um, providing a two-day training for supervisors and managers. So here's the trainings that your staff have learned, and here's how you're going to apply it in your your daily work um, in supporting your staff through um, continued trainings within our um, team meetings, unit meetings, and even all staff meetings. Um, so that's the how for us. Thank you, Jesse. So thinking about training for staff, like how have you guys done that on both understanding executive skills but then also helping participants use and build them. Jesse, do you want to start that one off? Sure. Um, so as I had mentioned, the um, coordinated case management, within that training we have, um, uh, we utilize the Colorado Family Support Assessment. Um, so you may hear me say CFSA, and that is the Colorado Family Support Assessment. Um, and that is a comprehensive three-part assessment that is, there's a baseline completed, um, and the ongoing assessment is done every 90 or less days, just depends on when they come in, um, but really reassessing every three months. And then we also have an exit assessment. Um, this supports in, you know, immediate uh, understanding of where the needs are with the participant in the three parts there's part A, B, and C. Part A is really that organic conversation that Joe was talking about um, when assessing somebody. So what are their basic needs and making sure that you're touching on all those needs. Um, and then um, part B goes into um, the family needs um, and also kind of um, what, what, is, what is the need of not just the, the parent, but then the parent caregiver um, and um, supporting with their children. Um, and then part C goes into the individual plan. A lot of what we're already doing, however, it's a different way to really look at what the goals are. Um, a lot of the times we have participants come in and I had seen in the chat, somebody had mentioned they feel like some people just kind of say what they need to say in order to get what they need right now and that's absolutely true. Um, and our job as coaches though is to help them kind of take a breath and say, okay, I, I saw that everything on here, these um, 10 items uh, of goals ranging from housing to transportation to child's education, mental health, and um, physical health is all a 10 for you. Um, so it sounds like everything is really important. How about we take those 10 and break it down to five, and then we take those five and break it down to three, really helping people kind of get a moment to breathe and see like, we want to help you reach all of these goals, and we also see that um, there's going to be baby steps to get to where you need to be. So um, it really allows that uh, support specialist to hold that space for a participant. Um, and in Part B, we also utilize the five protective factors. Um, five protective factors stems from the Children's Trust and Prevention Fund National Alliance, um, and it's also um, 
with the CFSA utilizing the Family Resource Centers across the nation. Um, and with the five protective factors, that's allowing um, the support specialist to dive into parental resilience, social and emotional competence of children, social support, concrete support, and understanding child development. Um, so this then kind of goes into, again, that strength-based approach. So um, when staff come in to my team and start, they're going through the coordinated case management, learning about these five protective factors and how to apply and have conversation to then um, pull out the strengths um, that the participants um, have within their families. Um, and then they go through a strength-based case management, which is four half-day trainings. That's actually through our community partners that we do contract with. There is um, a trainer on site that is trained within the five protective factors um, and is a certified family resource center. Um, and they do that training for our staff. Um, and we also have a good partnership with the Colorado Department of Human Services. Um, their coaching for success model does encompass motivational interviewing. It does talk, touch on trauma-informed care and executive skills. Um, and really, again, um, building out that common language um, is really important with staff. So it's nice to have a partnership with the state. Um, yeah, so I think I don't want to go over time, but it's kind of unfolding well, all you, of these pieces together. Thank you. Uh, Melanie, could you share a little bit too about training that you guys have done? Absolutely. Uh, we introduced the personal roadmap to our staff by having them take the tools for a road test themselves, which is really important. Um, we trained our staff on how to offer it, receive it, talk about it, and use it to create rapport to build a TANF workforce plan that makes sense for the family. We also included a brief section on easy goal setting and how to practice for staff to set an evening or weekend goal for themselves. And it really encouraged and empowered staff to change the tone of the TANF interview from a transactional interaction to a human interaction and supports parents in being the experts of their own lives. We also took the opportunity to blend in information about adverse childhood experiences and how our tool and workforce programs support resilience. And we facilitated small group practices to work through case scenarios. And this was really exciting and powerful because the trainees didn't realize they were real situations instead of the ideal training examples. And sometimes they would choose a different pathway based on their own expertise instead of following what the parent selected on their personal roadmap. And when we revealed the actual outcome, there were aha moments. And this emphasized to our staff the power of customer choice and voice. And they could see the positive results that took place when staff listened to what the customer wanted and put it into action. Thank you. So each of you have been working to incorporate executive skill building to your programs to varying degrees for quite some time. Based on these initiatives, can you share sort of your, each of you, can you please share your top sort of three pieces of advice that you would share with everyone on the line today on how to undertake a similar effort? Melanie, can you get us started on this one? Yes, absolutely. And I'll build on to what I just shared, that one of my top three is the first, we recommend developing a dynamic and impactful training plan that includes a wide variety of content, lecture video, and opportunities to see modeling or skill sets in action. Um, when we've provided safe opportunities to practice with interactive activities and make it fun, we often have the best results. And our staff gain confidence in the new skills and leave excited and inspired to put them into action. Um, going along with that, part of our learning along the way was to really utilize our staff feedback to keep us informed of what works well and what areas need more improvement for training. And then even post-training, we followed up with hosted sessions with um, different groups of staff uh, in our area to review multiple actual personal roadmaps that were completed. And we reviewed parent choices, what activities or agencies families were connected to, case documentation, and if they exited TANF and why. And we collected data and identified trends, which we shared broadly with all of our teams and leaders. The second thing I'll say is we suggest to keep it on the forefront. 
Uh, first, I want to recognize our amazing Washington staff and leaders for their support and for embracing a new approach. Uh, we are only effective because we have champions for this work who support the concepts and vision moving forward. So we'd really recommend highlighting, celebrating successes, uh, because our champions really appreciate hearing about how our work made an impact on families. And this allows us to showcase the results when we let customers drive toward their decisions, uh, toward their family goals. So in addition to sharing successes, it's critical to connect and communicate when new programs are launch that can benefit from a jumping off point from using the personal roadmap or self-assessment. And third, we'd suggest that you leverage the talent on your teams and within your network. We've connected with motivational interviewing experts to review our new tool and provide consultation. Um, they gave us support and assurance that our tool afforded another opportunity for our staff to use MI techniques and skills. And we've reached over 6,000 customers with this voluntary and effective pilot project. And we're now moving toward an inclusive statewide approach with our transforming case management initiative. And the self-assessment will continue to be offered to TANF customers, and we're working toward offering it to customers that may be in other state and federal programs. And the new tool, which is going to be named the Personal Pathway, includes options that can apply to all programs. We've also aligned technology efforts that are in progress right now to update our shared electronic system that our staff, partners, and contractors use to coordinate services for individuals and families in Washington. And lastly, we leverage our network by sharing results widely with partners, stakeholders, and leaders who have the influence or decision-making power to support long-term change. So those are my top three. Thank you. Jesse, what about you? Um, I'd piggyback off of Melanie with developing an impactful training plan. I think that's really important, and it's important for leadership. Um, to commit to it and also be okay with change um, because, um, again, these are um, ever, ever kind of changing times, but I would be, that's my first one. Supervisors and managers need to also be involved um, and there needs to be that um, process in which the, they're supporting their frontline staff um, and reinforcing their commitment to um, this, uh, to executive functioning um, and to the work that their staff is doing. Um, and also for frontline staff is really lean into the discomfort and the hard conversations. Um, as Joe was talking about, you know, listening authentically, um, those are, I feel, really important, especially when you're, when you're doing the work, um, kind of a little opposite of what we're talking about, the window of tolerance, you know, where you're saying, you know, we're in our comfort zone and everything, that's very important. And there's also this piece of growth for our um, coaches and support specialists to really, um, again, lean into the discomfort and um, show even vulnerability in yourself when you're helping um, somebody to be able to grow their own executive functioning skills, um, just as um, I believe it was Jesse or Dorothy that had had kind of shared their own um, uh, growth in their executive functioning skills. Those are important pieces to be able to have that relatability um, with your par uh, participants to be able to help them kind of grow and really normalize the conversation for them. Thank you. And Dorothy, anything that you would add? Anything that maybe wasn't shared in terms of advice that you would share with the group? Yeah, I just have um, one thing. I just want to comment on, uh, just add to what Jesse said. I want to, I want to make sure that everyone understands that when we're in our window of tolerance, we're in our comfort zone, that allows us to be able to lean in and, and, and um, address those difficult conversations or address um, challenges related to executive functioning. So those two work together. Um, the only couple that I wanted to mention that you, you don't want to let this be a one and done. This isn't a one and done kind of thing. This has to be incorporated in everything that we do in, in all parts of the work that we do. And we need to make sure that we create a curriculum that brings new employees on board. Um, it might not be the same level of curriculum, but we need to make sure new employees are trained the same way. And, and we need to provide, uh, the, other, the, the other thing I would say is to, is to identify or create simple tools and activities that staff can use to help customers. Um, 
and uh, to build upon their executive functioning skills. We've created, uh, in the midst of our training, we created some guides and tools that our staff can actually hand out or utilize for uh, with their customers that are visual, pretty easy to do, um, but that the, the client or customer can take with them. Great. The final question I wanted to pose to you guys is one that I've, I've been seeing in the chat book in different variations so far, and it, it's the, and it's an important one given our current circumstances. How are you guys adjusting some of these skill building strategies when many of us are in a distance or virtual working environment? Dorothy, can you start with that one? So, of course, it's been really challenging. Um, you know, in terms of bringing new employees, we, we are hiring people in the midst of COVID-19 restrictions. And so we had to modify our training to be online, which actually was really clunky. Um, it was hard to learn the technology. I mean, it was really challenging. And it was challenging. I think it's challenging for our new employees because there were times where I would be training I know this material, right? And I'd be training and I would just feel like, can they listen to anything more? And because you don't end up being able as a presenter to see your your participants very well, um, there were times where I'd go to uh, have open discussion and the, there would be a desk, empty desk um, <laughs> across from me. So um, anyway, so that was the issue in terms of training. But, but with... With regard to just being able to continue this approach, if you incorporate this in all that you do, if it is part of your assessment, if, if looking at executive functioning skills is part of your assessment and your goal setting, then, then the piece that we've added is making sure that our supervisors and managers and our operational program specialists who, who help train and engage with our staff, that we continue to provide materials and opportunities to check in with us and and have open forum in a in a viral a virtual environment. Um, we also are encouraging the local staff that actually are in the office um, to continue the discussion. And 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 what we're doing, my clinical staff is doing, is we're really trying to engage them in a process of doing the things that they need to do to stay within their window of tolerance, so they can help. Um, their customers who are also being uh, in a real isolated situation. Melanie, how about you? Thanks. Um, I'll start out by saying we've adjusted our training, delivery, and support for staff and supervisors. I have an amazing, an amazing team that I get to work with, um, some of who are on the call. Um, we've seen positive engagement, and they have expressed that they feel more supported and less isolated when we connect. Um, they've appreciated the opportunities to come together in community during this time, uh, especially. And we've increased communication by creating forums to connect more frequently. Um, we've provided information in a variety of ways to support different learning styles, such as videos, recorded WebExes or webinars, uh, written articles, warm-up activities. And we encourage and celebrate that hands-on participation virtually. Um, we are trying to focus on efforts that people can utilize in both their professional and personal lives. Um, we've identified that we actually have a richer conversation and, and the discussion is more balanced when we use virtual tools. Um, an example would be um, people that are usually quiet in person are more willing to contribute their ideas and thoughts in this new virtual place. And we feel this has, has elevated our team as a whole. For TANF customers, uh, we transitioned our services that were available as in-person only interactions and expanded access virtually to support the current environment. For example, we've worked with our partners to develop creative approaches to ensure the programs are still available. And we see success with connections to family advocacy, parenting education efforts, and parents growing their skills toward their long-term goals of education or employment. Um, and we've seen increased engagement from families that need and want support that may have struggled in the past to attend programs in person. And this has been another positive result of the current environment and really supports our vision of expanding access to our customers. Thank you. And finally, Jesse. Um, so we, too, have been working to transition our services online for our different workshops available through the Boulder County Workforce Center. Um, and all of our 
we were fortunate enough too to be able to have transitioned all of our staff to be able to work from home um, and connect with our par participants uh, via phone. Um, and also MS Teams is a virtual um, meeting place that uh, we utilize in addition to Zoom calls um, so that we're having an opportunity to at least see our participants and, um, and talk with them and have um, kind of a quote meeting, um, uh, first time meeting with them. Um, and we're also uh, been really problem solving the technological gap um, and access to computers and internet services. So it might be a either or, um, a participant may have a computer but doesn't have reliable internet services or has access to reliable internet, but then their computer or iPad for either themselves or even their children for homeschooling um, is inadequate. So currently we are actually um, putting forward a uh, request um, for unmet COVID needs, um, putting together an assessment and submitting that request to our county commissioners um, to be able to um, really discuss and um, kind of dissect this digital divide and how can we, um, and what can we do to be able to support the participants that perhaps are not being able to um, fully utilize the program and different resources because of this gap. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing as far as adjusting to the skill building and strategies. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for this really fruitful and useful information. I've seen quite a few uh, questions come through the chat box. So we have about 10 minutes, and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. The first one that we received has to do with resources. What resources um, can we use to promote greater executive functioning skills among our customers? Jesse, would you mind kicking us off with that one? Sure. Um, so there's a lot of different things out there. Um, one of my favorites is the free resource. So it's something that again, um, I've had I've had all of my staff um, complete, and then also uh, utilizing that with our participants. But it's a, a positive intelligence um, testing or uh, PQ testing, and you can go to positiveintelligence.com. Um, and it's a free assessment, again, for yourself and for your participants, um, and really helping you kind of boost your, your positive intelligence. So I guess we're, we're talking about uh, um, executive skills and how to regulate. Um, there's this other kind of piece with positive intelligence and emotional intelligence, really understanding yourself and your triggers, again, conversations and um, topics that we've talked about today. Um, and then when you complete this, it takes two minutes. Um, and then when you complete it, um, you can print it out and it'll give you a list of where you're at with um, your quote saboteurs. Um, uh, and this is really kind of, or you could also think of it as triggers. Um, and when you're looking at your saboteurs, you're also kind of then being able to see, well, what are you, how are you self-sabotaging? Um, and then through that, um, you know, supportive and strength-based lens, you can flip that with your participants and also be able to um, see where they're doing really well um, and help them kind of challenge um, themselves and build um, skills in another area. There's also Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Um, this would be through a book um, that's purchased. It's Travis Bradbury and Jean Graves. Um, Graves and you uh, complete a test and then um, the code in the back of your book and then the book kind of helps you outline what your test reveals for yourself. Um, so that would be one of um, the resources that I would recommend. Thank you. And can you restate that website again? I think somebody asked. Um, I can put it in the chat if that's helpful. Oh, that'd be great. That would be great. And I also saw a few questions that came in, again, about access to the slides and other resources that have been mentioned. Again, you might see in the downloadable files section, uh, there's a series of resources there that you may download and have access to, and one of those is the PowerPoint slides for today. Another question that came in, um, I think Joe is 
is, might be directed to you. Um, it came in while you were presenting. And it, and it asked about strategies that you would recommend for completing an assessment when you're not face-to-face. -face. So this speaks to you know, the virtual environment. Are there strategies that you would suggest folks consider when you're conducting an assessment but you're doing so virtually? It's a great question. We, we, the, the virtual world creates another whole set of challenges. I think you have to be pretty um, upfront in talking to the person in a way where you check in with them and ask them, you know, every five or seven minutes, are you, okay? you know, are you okay? Is there anything else going on? Is this a good time? If you hear noise in the background, can you know, can you focus, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I suppose, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend this, but some people have done this, is that you can, you can send out some sort of written questionnaire. Um, I generally don't like those because I don't think it allows the person to um, answer them fully or may not answer them fully, and it doesn't allow the rapport to build through the, um, through the interviewing process. What, though it could be used for, is a way to kick off a conversation and say, you know, hey, I see, I see you've, you know, indicated X, Y, Z. Can we talk more about that? And that way, you know, I'm guessing here probably, frankly, which is a terrible thing to do, but it may, it, 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 it may allow the rapport because it's their answers you're building on and maybe they feel comfortable starting where they were comfortable starting. Um, I, I, so much of this is about the, the confidence and the skill set and the intuitiveness of the worker. And, and some folks are better at this than others. And so those are two, three things I would suggest. You can always get the person to set their own appointment. And, I, and I'll mention real quick, Jed, I thought about, I thought about other things we hadn't mentioned. One of the things that, that I, I've seen states struggle with, we struggled with it tremendously, I realized, in the middle of a lot of conversion. The skill sets that are needed for coaching in general, in my opinion, are different than the skill sets that are needed for eligibility. For folks whose agencies do have not specialized the coaching and the workforce development function, I would have a greater set of concerns if those folks were the folks you hired as eligibility folks. Eligibility folks in general are, are, are I mean, toughest job on the planet. But they're black and white thinkers. It's a checkbox kind of an approach. It's a legal kind of approach. Workforce development is an intuitive set of, of, of skills. And so as you hire, people talk about hiring people, I would be looking for people who have you know, the other kinds of, uh, of, of uh, abilities and backgrounds and in intuitions than the, the black and white thinkers. I hope that helps somehow. Thank you. So we have just a few more minutes, um, and we've had another question come in, which is a tough one, but an important one. The question asks, well, what do we do when a client is rude or aggressive and negative during this process? You try to get the information, but there isn't cooperation from the other side. What would be the strategy to face this type of situation? Jesse, I'm so wondering is, if you could start us off, or Dorothy, I was going to, I think I heard your voice. If you might sorry, I was just, um, yeah, the only thing I was going to say is this is when MI come, becomes, the use of MI skills becomes important. Usually when that's happening, the person is either out, you know, they've been triggered by something, and so they're outside of their comfort zone, or um, they're ambivalent. And so when, when that's occurring, there's times where you need to check in, it may, you may need to take a break. You may need to change the environment for that customer or client. But again, taking a step back and having a conversation that isn't necessarily on your agenda, right? Allowing yourself to set aside the agenda that you have to be able to check in with that client and use those motivational in, interviewing skills. You know, get curious about what their goals are or what is important to them. When you're able to have that person talk in that manner, um, it becomes more about them, so so they can own it. Um, but sometimes you just have to use your de-escalation skills. There's some times where you just have to say this isn't the right time and reschedule, or um, or really do that that 
check that uh, change environment piece where you you take a break or or you have some you know you offer them a drink of water because in reality some people just need that piece to be able to kind of reset. Thank you, Dorothy. We had um, a couple people ask about the personal roadmap and um, where they might be able to find one. Um, and I think, Melanie, that was something that you had talked about. Would you mind sharing a little more about that? Hi. Uh, yes, it is a tool that we created in Washington. Um, it's not on the downloadable files, but what we could do is um, maybe share the draft or share the version. Uh, we've gone through a number of versions and landed on um, our final one that's going to be the personal pathway. And I'd be happy to maybe maybe we could share it and attach it to the downloadable files after. I don't know if there's a way to do that or through the listserv. Yes, yes. And we have just one minute, so we'll have to close out Q&A. And I know that there's been some more questions that have come up. Thank you all for your active sort of participation in today's webinar. And we'll to, can take a look at these questions and circulate additional responses, as well as that tool that Melanie just mentioned. I'm going to turn things over now to James Butler to close us out. James? Thank you, Jesse, and just want to um, express our sincere thanks and appreciation to everyone um, for participating in today's webinar. Um, as always, thank you to our presenters, Jessica, Dorothy, Joe, Jesse, and Melanie and Kristen for taking time out of your busy schedules to share with us today. And most importantly, of course, um, all of you who have joined us um, in the listening audience, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we, of course, hope this session has been informative and we look forward to continuing our work with you um, as you continue to work with your clients or customers, even through times like these. So um, if we were not able to respond to your question today, um, by the chat box, as Jesse already mentioned, um, we will provide you with an answer to those questions and make them available shortly um, as, as a follow-up to this event. Um, and th those resources will be available on our PeerTA website. Um, if you have further inquiries, feel free to, feel free to reach out to us. Um, as we close out, um, a brief survey will automatically pop up on your screen. Um, and if you would be so kind as to complete that survey, um, as it will assist us in, in our planning for future webinar topics. On um, behalf of OFA and my director, Lisa Washington Thomas, I want to thank you again. Um, enjoy the remainder of your day and continue to remain safe. Thanks so much, everyone.